Welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming. This is our fifth Art Innovation Talks, presentations to educate, inspire, and ignite your imagination. These 45-minute Zoom presentations are being offered live exclusively to our ISEA members on a quarterly basis. This is amazing that we have actually completed a first year and started a second. Um, they cover a variety of topics to encourage, enrich, and support our members' creative journeys, which is a key component of the ISEA's mission statement. Before I introduce our presenter, Alan Hirsch, let me introduce you to today's manager moderator, Kim Gill. She'll be collecting your questions uh, uh, to ask Alan after his presentation. I'll also be working behind the scenes managing Zoom. A big thank you to the Art Innovation Committee for making these presentations possible. Kim, could you please explain how this is all gonna work for us? Sure, absolutely. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for being here. First of all, know that all of your mics have been muted. This allows everyone to be able to listen clearly without any potentially distracting noises in the background. So in order to ask Alan a question, um, and you can do this you know, during his presentation and after, simply go to the chat option. If you're on an Apple iOS device, such as an iPad, you simply go to the upper right-hand corner and there's three dots there to access it. If you're using a Mac OS or a Windows device, just find the chat option in the bottom of your Zoom screen. So type in your question, hit send, and uh, I will be collecting them and try to get to all of them um, after Alan's presentation. So um, that is it. Thanks, thanks so much. Back to you, April. Thank you, Kim. So today we have Alan Hirsch. In fact, let me let me bring him up on screen. He is a PhD and ISEA member and a multiple award winner, including a fourth place award in ISEA's 2020 Utterly Unfathomable and po po Powerfully Profound. I don't know how anybody says the name of this show without stumbling. <laughs> Alan is um, a practicing biophysicist but in 2012, he began developing a complex mathematical color and space manipulation engine designed to powerfully transform digital photographs. He's been expanding the code for over nine years, allowing him to create a wide array of representational, impressionistic, surreal, and abstract images, purely through using mathematics. After setting the stage for us, Alan will share some examples of his work and how explain how he manipulates photos to reflect a totally different perspective in digital art. Welcome, Alan. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to start uh, with a, a, a verbal explanation before I go to imagery. So you have some you know, basic idea of how I'm, I'm doing things. Um, let's see, there we go. So this is, this is a, again, a little bit of philosophy and also some, you know, you know, simple technical explanation for how I, how I work. Uh, generative art is a form of robotic painting where in a set of computer instructions constructs a digital image. Most serious contemporary generative art is centered around the creation of algorithmic structures that attempt to paint preconceived visual images. The artist usually modifies the code repeatedly to approach a desired vision, since dynamic mathematical processes often defy anticipation. The actual creation is usually a dialogue between the computer programmer and an evolving image with surprises along the way, much like the dialogue between a manual painter and the canvas. The generative system I have created constructs images differently. It uses one or two existing digital images. If two, they are hybridized, much as 
Photoshop hybridizes them, to generate a third image. Much of how this third image is constructed can be understood by way of the following analogy. Imagine a, an image made of wet paint. The artist takes a brush and begins to swirl the paint around or takes a dab of paint from one part of the image and transfers it to another part. Now imagine that the tip of the brush is so fine and the image is discerned at the microscopic level such that the artist can control the movement of each individual dye element in the paint, which would be each pixel in a di di digital image. Finally, imagine that the movement of the brush holding each dye element is controlled by complex patterning strategies the artist conceives. That is very close to what I do with my main painting engine. In addition, a second system of mathematical transformations of each pixel's colors are, can also be run in my system. In this second color transformation, the colors of each pixel's nearest neighbors are mathematically manipulated and the sum of the results added to the color values of the pixel in the center being modified. Because I can control the parameters in the equations to one part in a billion billion, I can manipulate my images with great precision and can systematically alter the equations to try to achieve an acceptable aesthetic. By using the constraint of an initial image, I automatically start with an information rich structure. And this is a powerful way to extract new unanticipated structure. Making compellingly beautiful images is a major goal for me. This is because I have a deep curiosity about what distinguishes one image as beautiful and another as not. I do not believe that the answer is trivial or even easily known, but it has been central to our artistic exploration since ancient times. This mystery of beauty is a, ma is a major driver of my mathematical exploration of beauty and meaning. This is especially because my incorporation of complex synthetic objects with organic images injects a reality that could not have been ev evolutionarily hardwired and is an exploration of a class of things central to the advance of science. In terms of religion, my art is a celebration of sentience. The miracle, as Einstein put it, that we can understand anything. I'm exploring the interaction of dynamic logic with images of the physical world. If nothing else, it is full of delightful surprises. I would liken it to wading into a field of wildflowers in an unexplored prairie. Since all digital artists, photographers and painters alike, use the tools of modern technology, digital cameras and software to create art in this way, I believe this quest is ubiquitous. I believe the opportunity digital art presents should be celebrated, not disdained. And with that, um, I'm going to switch to, um, let's see. I'm going to switch to my um, visual presentation so you can see what I actually do. Okay, so this is a, um, a photo that my daughter took when she was a teenager in, in, on, on her way to Israel, and she stopped overnight in, in the Netherlands. And she took this picture of a very beautiful antique lamp in a doorway in Amsterdam. And she's a better photographer than me, so I use a lot of her photographs. This is a, a photograph of a pansy, of course, that I took at Green Spring Gardens, a lovely little botanic garden in northern Virginia in the suburbs of Washington, where I live, I, I live in the sub, Maryland suburbs of Washington. And so now I'm going to show you a, a multiply transformed, hybridiz, transformed hybridization of the pansy with the lantern in the door, doorway. This is what it looks like. Now, this is part of a series that I developed from this sort of hybridization that reminded me very strongly of a modern technique de uh, developed by the very famous German artist, Gerhard Richter. While he was a brilliant representational painter in his youth, like Chuck Close, and like Chuck Close, he moved towards abstraction strongly as he aged. In the early 2000s, he um, developed this flow system where he pours large amounts of paint on a glass surface moves it around with a sponge until he likes it, and then slams down another pane of glass on top of it, allowing it to diffuse in a totally uncontrolled manner. And that produces these flow, you know, complex flow patterns. 
So he's given up most of the control that he's so elegantly ca capable of. So this set of transformations produced an image that is very reminiscent of his flow series. But in my case, if I preserved all the parameters, I could do it over again and get exactly the same image or an um, image mo slightly modified, which you couldn't do the way he does it unless he took the pane of glass off and tried to paint something. And that results in some very interesting variations. So this is that image that you just saw run through a, a, a set of equations that produces complex symmetries, sort of Rojark-like symmetries. But as you can see, they're integrated seamlessly into the flow, in, into parts of the flow system that they don't, they don't interact with. And so you get a mixture of symmetry and sort of that, you know, uh, chaotic flow pattern, which, which again, could not be achieved the way he normally does it. We, you would have to try to do it manually after you created a flow image. But the other thing is now I can re-diffuse that, like I've done the flow over again, as exemplified in this, in this image, which you can see is, is the symmetry, but now flowed again. So that's sort of a way of saying that the, the mathematics can extend this very interesting uh, technique that was developed by that famous artist. This is a vase of flowers that was arranged by my late mother in her old age. She was a brilliant landscaper. She was young. She retired to Florida and she collected silk flowers. Her apartment was wall to wall silk flowers. And she went to flea, flea markets and she had a really sharp eye. So she bought cheap vases that were pretty. She came home and did these beautiful uh, silk flower arrangements. And towards the end of her life, I, I went down and I photographed all of them and I used them as a source of, um, of uh, a very interesting uh, patterning for, uh, for the creation of, of, of abstract um, images. So this is that vase of flowers. Now, as you may remember, part of my program, I manipulate just locally each pixel by manipulating its colors. That preserves the sort of geometric structure of the system, as you can see. It's very obviously the same vase of flowers, but as you can see, the colors have now been intensely transformed and, and you know, they're more flamboyant than the original and very different. And there are patterns. Um, you can see the, the, the rose or, or camellia, I guess that's a camellia, um, is uh, is pretty much you know, uniformly bright red with some pink highlights, but now it's got far more textural variation from that system because I'm, I'm modifying each color channel separately. Now, if we put that into the main engine, which rearranges pixels as I described in my verbal uh, presentation, we can get a remarkable change in, 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 the, in the sense of the, of the photograph. This is that same image. You can see the colors um, rearranged. This, this struck me as, as being a sort of surreal, almost you know, maybe Dali-esque uh, image of a young woman getting ready to party. Well, not a, not a normal woman, but some alien version on the right her party dress over on the far left. And you can see, if you look here, just above the party dress, there's the, there's the vase itself and you can see the flowers stretched out, but now it's been turned on its side and made a minor, minor part of the whole picture. So this gives you an idea of how interesting it is to rearrange things mathematically because you're still got a lot of order, even though the mathematics is complicated. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, um, so let's see. So let's go to the next. This is an old barn in Pennsylvania, okay, um, that is on a 60-acre organic farm run by a friend of mine. It's a wonderful farm. They bring a lot of produce into Washington. And he has visitation days. Um, that, that um, uh, 
around June 1st. They were they were suspended because of COVID, but um, the um, the um, uh, the barn was a, 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 a just a wonderful uh, temptation. Of course, I took a bunch of pictures up there, and this barn is like a lot of photographs in my work that have been an endless fascination. I didn't realize, of course, when I started doing this years ago, that certain photographs would provide a very special attraction for me and that I'd go back to them over and over again. I've transformed this barn several thousand times in all kinds of surreal, impressionist, and, um, and uh, just colorized versions. And it, it just keeps drawing me back. I don't know why, and it's it's it 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 it's productive. It it often produces interesting images. So here's a one of the, my early images in in the impressionist mode, uh, with a touch of surreality to it. Manet is my favorite painter, and um, the um, uh, the the patina here it, it really shows that. But of course, there are little surreal elements the way the the color in the old stove in the front there has been sucked out and splattered like 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 uh, fresh paint on on the, on the barn and the way the barn is sort of duplicated in the diff in the distance uh, those are those are more surreal elements you know not quite Magritte although he's sort of an influence on me too um, because uh, of his injection of of unreal things into otherwise real landscapes. But this is the same photograph, okay? But manipulated now, not in color, the colors are preserved in each pixel, but heavily manipulated over and over again uh, by rearranging pixels. And what you can see is, is a bizarre, surreal landscape. It's difficult to categorize. Um, Dolly wouldn't exactly do it this way, and Magritte wouldn't exactly do it this way, but um, it has sort of elements of that, and maybe a little element of Escher too. Um, but of course, it, it 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 gives you a very imaginative sense of of um, you know uh, how a landscape can become almost bizarre. A friend of mine, another artist, once said, "Do you think somewhere in the universe that exists?" And I said, only if there are multiple universes, I don't think it exists anywhere in ours. This is the piece that won fourth, um, fourth uh, place in the um, in the uh, uh, the juried, oops, the juried um, show for the for the ISEA. Um, this is my daughter's printer uh, that sat on her desk when she was in high school. I took a photo of it. And it's another one like the barn that I do over and over and over again, because it just endlessly gives me fascinating images. In this case, of course, it looks like it's decaying, maybe melting in a fire. And it immediately, I got the sense that it, it, it was a nice representation of writer's block, how, how one's mind might be sort of almost feeling like it's falling apart because you cannot move forward creatively. And of course, painters, <laughs> often suffer the same thing. I don't normally do social action stuff. Um, I do have a, a, a large series of um, satires of the um, former occupant of the Oval Office. But um, another photo that my daughter took was of a beautiful antique windmill in a rural area outside of Amsterdam. And I use that windmill like I use the barn and the printer over and over again. And in doing that, I've had certain pieces that emerged as, as representing to my mind uh, some of the struggles we're having over energy in this civilization, notably things that celebrate solar power or, or indicate the conflict between the fossil fuel um, industry, the fossil fuel culture, and the emergence of renewable energy. In this case, it seems to me this sort of represents 
on the bottom, uh, solar power as it started off, it blackened by oil, and, you know, dominated by oil. And then as it rises into the sun and, and has a tinge of green, because it's green energy, um, you know, uh, it, it sort of celebrates the dawn of a new day. The same photo of, of, a, of, of, a, um, of a windmill, that windmill, manipulated in a totally different way, gave me a totally different, you know, feel. Uh, this, when I saw this, when I developed this, um, the image on the left immediately re reminded me of the monsters in, in Maurice Sendak's absolutely charming children's books. You know, this thing seems joyous. It's, yes, it has two little fangs, but it's throwing its 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 um its uh, windmill arms up and it's got a big sort of gargoyleish grin on and it it just said sendak sendak to me so i thought it was very playful and it it really it's it's really one of my favorite trans transformations of that particular photograph on the other hand this is also a comical transformation of the same photograph when i looked at this when i finally developed this i thought hey, that looks like Bugs Bunny, right? Yeah, there's the nose and you can see the ears, uh, all of those variations of the windmill's um, uh, arms. And, um, you know, very colorful and also very playful. Now, this is another piece that I've shown at ISEA. Um, this piece was made from a photo I took of a, a, an oaken salt shaker and an oaken pepper mill next to a very, very mundane white ceramic sugar bowl. And of course it's been transformed in such a way that if I didn't tell you that, you would have absolutely no idea where it came from. But if you look at this, you look at this structure here, you see those two holes that's in the salt shaker. So this is the top of the salt shaker, see? And this is also from either the pepper mill or the salt shaker, but transformed in a totally different way. Um, I cannot honestly tell you that I can, you know, <laughs> confidently tell you <laughs> where the sugar bowl went. It, it got too transformed. But it gives you an idea of, how, again, how you can retain structures in certain ways, but manipulate them so they produce a totally different landscape. I interpret this as a, as a, a microscopic uh, uh, parasite or a pathogen, maybe like a bacteria, penetrating a living cell. This is from the same photograph. Now you can sort of see the top, this top here of the pepper mill, you, I think that's sort of obvious. You stare at it. This is probably the sugar bowl, but so manipulated, you would never know. But as you can see, you generate an, a totally different abstract transformation. One of the nice things about um, this system of hybridization is you get a lot of transparencies like this, where you have different layers of manipulation um, and, and, um, so it's like, it's like uh, tra semi-transparent washes in painting. And that's my, that's my, my show. Um, Thank you, Alan. <laughs> um, it was fascinating presentation. You just certainly um, helped me understand just how complex digital photography can be, especially with your, um, mathematical approach. I love all your colorful work. We have a, a lot of questions to go to. So I'm going to start with one. Um, please explain what hybridiz hybridization means. In, um, in the digital uh, world, a photograph is actually a string of numbers in the computer's memory. They're triplets. Each triplet represents a pixel. And the, the computer knows where to put it on the screen uh, by the nature of, of, the, of the file type, BMP or TIFF or something like that. Mm -hmm. And each 
triplet represents the intensity of the phosphors on the screen, red, green, blue. So tells you how strong red is, how strong blue is, and how strong green is. And um, that combination, due to the nature of, of human vision, can give you every color that your eye can see. So those bright yellows behind me are strong, very strong uh, uh, red, very strong green, and blue, weaker blue. A hybridization is where you take two images and at each pixel, you know, in, in, in the same X, Y position, you, you add a, a fraction of the red from one and a fraction, a complementary fraction of, of the other. So you take 30% of red from the first image and 70% of red from the other image. And that tends to give you, as I said, transparency. You sort of, if you do dominant in 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 in, in, um, in, in the colors in one, you tend to get you know uh, a see through a, a ghost of the other. So that's what hybridization amounts to. It's a, it's a con it's a it's a simple algebraic averaging of the the color values in each channel. Doesn't seem that simple. <laughs> okay, we have another uh, another question. How many steps? Um, is how many steps are taken in your normal process? We saw two for the, ve the vase of flowers. Might you continue from there? Yeah, what I'm doing is uh, if I start a new series, I'll take, I'll take a photograph, say that I'm very interested in like the bar. I'll choose a new set of equations. I have several thousand equations. I add equations all the time. It's far more you can see all the white in my beard. It's far more than I can exercise in my lifetime. So it's it is like waiting around in a in a, in a you know a, a, a giant field of wildflowers. And I will I will choose parameters for those equations and I'll run it and I'll see what I get, which is like candid photography. Once I have an image, unless it's wonderful right away, which it can be, um, I'll start thinking about how to manipulate it to eliminate on aesthetic elements or to push it in a more interesting way. And that may go on for minutes if I get something interesting or hours, depending on how many interesting things I get. Also, sometimes uh, the equations I'm working with are quite recalcitrant and sort of like a painter struggling with a painting. I'll work on something for hours and hours and hours. Sometimes I just give up because I can't get an aesthetic image. So again, that's all not so different from what any other artist does uh, when, when they can't control things exactly the way they like. Sure. Great. Okay. Are you using a ready-made program for your algorithms or are you doing the math yourself? I would like to know the, the program name and if yourself, you mentioned Photoshop. Um, okay. So everything right from the beginning, I decided that everything I did was with, 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 with reasonably expert at computer, computer programming as a scientist. So I, 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 I just, this program is entirely my, my code. I do use Photoshop for certain things. I use Photoshop to print mostly and sometimes to examine the color numbers. It's very easy. I mean, I put an image in and I can start looking at the pixels if I'm interested in the color numbers. Um, but even for blowing things up so I can make large pieces, I invented and patented another way to blow up images that which came from the algorithms I, I use in my art. And it, it's quite successful, so I can make very large pieces that have elegant quality to them. But yeah, no, I don't, I don't use CAN programs. It's just okay. what I write myself. Um, that same person asked, uh, she suggests that she does a lot of 360 photo grammetry work. Hope I said that right. I can see this process adding another level to that. Um, I'm not sure what she's using, so I don't know. I mean, I've never heard of it, so I don't know. I don't know oh, okay. All right. Um, sorry, we couldn't answer that one. Uh, another person asked, do you have specific commands to get the results you have achieved? Well, the way the process works, as I said, when I first use a new set, a new set of equations, um, I, um, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm like a candid photographer. Candid photographer goes out into the world 
and you know maybe they wander around in, a, in, in the woods somewhere and then they see a scarlet tanager on a on a branch and they you know if they're a good photographer then they start working on how to capture that bird in the most interesting way and there are many elements to that the bird's position what it's doing the light the angle how close you can get you know what your camera stuff is so i'm like that i'm i'm, I'm i start with a set of equations um and I see what I get. And sometimes I think, well, if I modify these equations, it's going to be a richer image. So I'll do that. Or sometimes I'll just play with the parameters, you know, the coefficients, the exponents and stuff in the equations and keep trying to push it there. I, I understood after all these years, many ways of, of pushing equations to make them produce something aesthetic much faster than, than I used to know. I mean, like any artist, I mean, I, I've learned a lot about how to use my program much more efficient and and I throw more away and get more aesthetic results than I did five or ten years ago so that's that's basically what I do um again it's 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 a lot like a, a you know a painter will come to a canvas and they'll paint and, and maybe it's going in a um uh um a a um a certain direction and, and maybe the painting starts talking to them and they go in another direction. I just saw an explanation of, of the 360 um, system. Uh, I don't know how that would integrate. I, I do know this, that one of the things I do is I'll transform an image and then I'll rotate it 90 degrees and transform it again. So I'm exchanging the X and Y values. And that proves to be a very rich way to very much more quickly add all kinds of really interesting complex structure. And you keep doing that. And then I'll combine that with what's called recursion, where um, at a, at a, if I'm at a pixel, I'll transform it. And then I'll take the numbers that come out of the transformation and feed them back into the equation for that pixel and do it again and do it again and do it again. And I can do that at different levels. And that what that produces is, um, is something that's a little like what fractals do. It's not the same. Fractals paint mathematics. I'm not painting mathematics. I'm using mathematics as paint and brush, but it, it has some of the same elements since fractal uh, art is developed through this feedback mechanism I'm talking about. Okay. Sounds very complex. <sighs> um, well, your program that you've developed, is this something that you could um, share with others or market it or anything that, or is it just all a personal? It, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, my- Because uh, I don't know any of this. Yeah, my assumption is that it would not be an easy, at all easy for me to market it to, or, or, you know, to other artists because I'm constantly going into the code and, 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 and modifying it and looking at it too. That's the other thing is, you know, if you get a certain result and there's certain things about it you don't like, you, you look at the equations, you try to, as you do in science, you try to think about what are they doing? But if you can't look at the equations, and there's a lot of equations, and you have to have a feel for how manipulating ma mathematical systems would work. And it, it's just not n normally what artists do. One, there is one element of what I do that I did have tried to market. I, I've patented the blow up software. Uh, there is other specialty software that photographers sometimes use, Alien Skin, PhotoZoom, Perfect Resize, based on different mathematics than mine, which allows people to, to make images a lot bigger and, and, and retain a lot of quality. I'm not going to bore people with explaining what the limitations of those systems are. I know any photographer can tell you they might use them when they have to, but they're not, they don't want to use them most of the time. And what I found is that in the years since I first started working on this problem in the 1990s, um, digital cameras have become so powerful that it's only very rarely that a professional photographer would need software to do that. And they just aren't very receptive. I mean, I've tried and they're, they're not, they're not much interested in, in, in buying it. So just use it myself. <laughs> okay. We did get an answer back from one of our artists. Um, photogrammetry is photographing uh, an object 360 degrees for the purpose. 
process of creating a 3D model. And sometimes she says, I take it back to 2D after the manipulation. Yeah, as I said, I, I, I rotate it, uh, which I can simply do in, in Windows, yeah. 90 degrees. Um, I, I could do something like what that person is talking about, you know, in, in algorithmically rotate it, you know, any number of degrees, like 32 degrees, or, and do a series of rotations like that, which can be transformed into a 3D structure. The most yeah. basic reason why I don't do that is it means spending an awful lot of time on one image to create that. It's similar to why I haven't done videos, even though I know how to do them. I bought the special software for constructing the, um, the, uh, uh, constructing the, 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 the actual movie, you know, and I've, I've set up a series of, 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 you start with one image and you, 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 you and you go to an, another image by manipulating the parameters and the equations. And at both ends, you have something very interesting, but very different. And you know then how to, increment the, the parameters in small steps in between them, which would give you an image which slowly in a liquid fashion transforms from one to the other. And they would be very interesting, but it, it takes up many gigabytes. It would have to be done overnight in my, my backup, big backup drive. And it's just a lot of effort to develop sort of one artistic entity, which is a video, which is nice. Mm -hmm. and maybe someday I'll do it if I live long enough. Right. Or yeah. maybe not, because in the interim time when I'm doing all that, I can make an enormous number of very interesting still images. And so that's I guess that's my artistic preference. OK, super. Well, we had a few comments on your work. Um, someone said the red one of the windmill, that version, they found it to be very lovely. And another the um, an extraordinary crown piece is wonderful. So that is nice to hear. And they are, they're fascinating, be, be fascinating work you do. Okay, uh, we did have another question. Have you ever considered to do a collaborative piece with another artist? Now, this is a good, good question. What um, do you think of that, Alan? It's interesting. Um, no, uh, <laughs> I, have, I have a good friend who's also, she's a retired scientist. She was a very distinguished scientist. Um, and she has become a digital artist too. And she mm -hmm. does things very differently than me. And we've had a, a dual show together and we've tried to have, you know, we've petitioned curators to do more uh, dual shows because we like each other's work and they're very, it's very, mine's very different from hers. Um, and the... <laughs> So we only had one dual show because only one gallerist let us do that. Sure. Um, there's a kind of a cute tale associated with that too. The gallerist, she ran a small gallery up in Frederick, which is a, 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 sit, you know, a city about 30 miles north of Washington. And she, um, she was an eccentric. She was a young woman, very bohemian, a sort of a throwback to the 60s type. Um, so I did an abstract show and... Um, I, you know, I, uh, my friend's work uh, was more representational, but three or four months before our show, she did a Neo Dada show. So she had a lot of strange art, right? And she had seen some of my nudes. <laughs> and she, she said, and she particularly liked one that was really strange. And I happened to have printed it three feet by four feet and framed it. So she said, would you put that in my daughter show? It'll look good in my daughter show. So I did that, right? Didn't sell. A few months later, we're going, we're, uh, 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 Terry and I are having our, our show and she'd been renting the, uh, the, the gallery for, um, for our art classes during the week and taught by local artists and mostly retired women in their 50s, 60s, maybe even 70s who were taking up painting were most of the students. And those people followed her gallery. They were uh, uh, fans of the gallery. So at our opening auction, a lot of those people came in. And I was talking to a, a woman, uh, probably in her 60s, okay. And we were having a very nice conversation about the work. 
and somehow or other, I mentioned that I'd been in the Dada, that I'd had that piece in the Dada show. And she looked at me and she got very cold. She said, that was you? <laughs> yes. She said, well, let me tell you something. When we were painting, we made the, the instructor put a sheet over that so we didn't have to look. Oh, at dear. It. Oh, gosh. Well, so, <laughs> you know, and most of my, as you see from what's behind my head, most of us, and what you saw on the show, I mean, most of us, stuff was not very controversial. Although I was banned for a while on Instagram when I tried to put up uh, one of my pieces um, yeah. promoting solar energy. They're so antsy about everything now that if you have anything that they deem a political content, they'll, they'll jump on you. It's kind of terrible. Well, as far as collaboration too, going back to that, um, instead of collaborating with another digital art. No, I, I know what you're saying. I, I, you, I haven't done that. I haven't, I just with, haven't. It, with it just a, a painter or a, you know. Whatever. Yeah, and, and nobody's approached me. Yeah, nobody's approached me that wanted to do that. I, I mean, That's I guess. One, thought. Yeah, one way I could do that is they could either be another digital artist or, or, or a manual artist and they give me an image and say, transform this. And then they could paint from what I transform and we could go back and forth, something like that, but nobody's ever proposed it. Right, right, good. Well, those are all the questions we have right now. Um, I don't know if anybody else has anything else out there. April, how about you? I think we've got them all right now. Yeah, it looks like it. <clears throat> I was actually the one who asked the collaboration question, yeah. and um, and I and the reason I asked about it was in the context of that 360 degree um, image question, because it would be sort of interesting, you know, if the two of you were interested in working together to see what would be the outcome of taking those 360 degree images and then manipulating them through your program. So that was, that was what popped in my head. <laughs> but uh, your idea also of going back and forth with an artist of, you know, you doing a piece would, inspired would, by would, them and them doing a piece inspired by yours would be very interesting as well. I think that would, for me, that would be a very interesting kind of collaboration, but nobody's ever proposed it. Of course, you're local, you could do it. <laughs> All right. Well, let me let me wrap up here since we've got gone through all of our uh, all of our comments. And all right. So um, I do want to thank you, Alan. Um, I think your presentation was ever intriguing to see what you're doing with your art, and uh, I it's just really fascinating, and it's. It would be um, it would be interesting to see what would happen with some collaborations. So that, that's something to think about. And and thank thank you very much to the ISEA for the for this opportunity. I I really enjoyed doing it, and and I hope other people were got something nice out of it. That, that's all I can say. Yeah, I think it's really fascinating what you've been able to achieve. Um, so, you know, I, I, I hope that the audience has been equally as fascinated as I. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you. Our next presentation is going to be in November with Kim Santini. Um, today's video will be put together um, and displayed on YouTube. Um, an email will be sent to the members. And it, the link will also be shared um, on our social media channels. Um, if you aren't already following us, our Facebook channel is, uh, you can search on isea.artists. And we also have an Instagram channel and it's also ISEA artists, but without the dot. Um, so we hope that you'll join us again in November. I think that's it for today. Thank you, Alan. Bye, everyone. <laughs>